And I'm very, very pleased today, um, you know, to have two um, incredible speakers with us, uh, Roger Love, who's the CEO and founder of VoicePlace, as well as Natika Washington, who's the Vice President of Corporate Partnerships at the, at the Prison Fellowship uh, in Chicago. Um, a little bit about, about sales choice, not to do too much of a commercial, and then I'm going to introduce uh, my co-host, uh, Debbie McGrath, who's the CEO and founder of HR.com, who's also co-sponsored to tell you a little bit about her company. Um, for those, many of you do know me and you know what we do, uh, there are others here that might be the first uh, opportunity to hear uh, the voice. Uh, we, set, we effectively specialize in ending revenue uncertainty using advanced AI methods. And we have a software platform, uh, you can read all about it on the web. Uh, we have a new book out on AI that my partner and I just recently published called The AI Dilemma. Uh, and we're also setting up a, a global network called the Sales Leader Network to really connect our, our leaders in that community. Um, we've been fortunate to be recognized by the community um, around the world. We recently were just recognized for the Outstanding AI Sales Platform of the Year from the Corporate Excellence Awards this year. And uh, last year, we were privileged to be one of the top 20 recognized technology companies in Canada. Um, specifically, the goals of the men and women having courage series is very much a project and evolution. Um, you know, I stepped back and thought really hard and I thought, you know, number one, I'm hoping that all of you find some new voices or new networks uh, here um, that might inspire you and take you to different places. Um, the people that are selected to speak, uh, they usually have either some deep personal connection to me and my personal network, or there's someone recently that's been an inspiration for a story I wanted to bring forward. So the curation here is um, one that I think is very thoughtful and probably quite unique and not always the voices that you have access to in your lives. Um, maybe at the end of the, the main message, um, and Debbie, I really loved your tagline that you have at hr.com, which is really about maximizing human potential. We've had some other amazing speakers. Um, Siobhan Thatcher spoke in our last session on diversity and inclusiveness from a sales perspective. Uh, you can hear that presentation um, easily. It's, uh, it's on YouTube. We also had Margie Worrell speak. Um, Margie and I sit on the Forbes advisory board. Uh, she has her PhD in leadership and one of her areas of expertise is on courage and bravery. Uh, so a lot of the inspiration I think really came from listening to her presentations. Uh, she speaks boldly and somebody I think definitely you could follow as well. Um, within the Canadian landscape, uh, Debbie Rosati spoke uh, last time and I, if you're not familiar with the Women Get On Board, it's an opportunity to build skills on board governance and board leadership and Debbie has a community that you can connect with if you're looking to get on either public or privately held boards, mainly in Canada, although she's branching out, but she's definitely a mover and shaker in terms of board governance. Uh, the Diversity Institute, if you looked across Canada and you tried to understand where there's good research in terms of diversity inclusiveness, uh, which is an error we must get bolder. We've certainly seen a lot of issues that have happened over the past 24 months in this particular area and uh, lots of tender uh, thoughts um, and good research to back up your efforts with practical tools. And definitely Wendy uh, Kukir is one of our leaders uh, in our country. I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie uh, now to say a few words about HR.com. Sure, so we are the largest community of human resource professionals globally. We have a lot of education and training to help them maximize their own career potential. But every HR professional touches every employee Every employee touches every, um, every member of a community. So HR's role in the business is really growing and we like to maximize everyone's potential so that we have um, a whole community that's contributing to the workforce. So Debbie, thank you so much. And um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Roger Love, who's the founder and CEO of The Voice Place. I uh, just want to say to everybody here, I've had the honor and the privilege of getting to know Roger over the last 18, might even be 24 months since we met at the Forbes conference. Uh, Roger is not only an inspiration to change your voice, he has helped me discover that probably the greatest instrument we have is our voice and how underutilized it is. Uh, Roger is not just a friend, he's also a partner. And I'm just so thrilled and honored, Roger, that you're here today 
and I'm going to turn everything over to you now. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much, Cindy, for the lovely welcome. I'm so happy to be here. She said, my name is Roger Love. By the way, I was born with that name. My father's name was Leon Love. I didn't change it. I, I grew to like it. So I'm a voice coach. I basically spent the earliest part of my career teaching singers what sounds they should make, what sounds should come out of their voices so that they could influence the millions of the people they were reaching for. And then I started working on the speaking voice and I realized that there were some fundamental flaws in the way that I saw people communicating. So today I'm just here to share with you some of what I've learned so that each of you can use your voice to influence the way that people perceive you so that you can move your listeners emotionally and have more control over the outcome of each conversation that you enter into. Today's theme is about courage. So yes, the sounds that we're gonna talk about today will help you showcase even more of the courage that you already possess inside all of you. So first, let me say that I believe that your voice should be the most powerful communication tool that you possess. But I also believe that most people are trapped behind voices that don't, don't even begin to showcase how special or courageous they are. Have you listened, any of you, to your own voicemail greeting lately? And do you like the way it sounds? Because most people do not. We buy a new phone. We go to record a new voicemail greeting. Hi, this is Roger Love. I'm so happy to be here. Leave a message. And you listen back and it sounds boring and lifeless and you sound a little depressed. So you try over and over again, hoping to finally love the sound of your voice on the machine, but you never really reach that point. You settle, thinking, oh, that's good enough. I'm a professional, I can't spend any more than 20 minutes making a, a silly voicemail message. But guess what? That voice on your phone greeting, the one you settled with, the one you don't really love, is the same voice that you use every single day, every time you open up your mouth. And if you don't really like or love it yourself, why, why should anyone else feel that way about it? One big problem is that most of us think that the voice we have is the voice we were born with. But I'm I'm here today to, to break that myth. It's not true. We were all born with an instrument and we just learned, we need to learn how to play that instrument better. The voice that you have right now is simply an imitation of the voices you heard when you were learning to speak. If your mom sounded really airy and soft, oh, Roger, you're so much cuter than your brother, and, and you wanted to connect with her because you were hungry and you were trying to survive, as soon as you could speak, you imitated her voice. Hungry, mommy, feed me. If your dad sounded like this and he was very rough and and he kept saying that he was, he was going fishing, that he loved going fishing. And you wanted him to take you fishing when you were old enough. As soon as you could make sounds, you said, Daddy, fishing, take me, take me. We learn, we learn the words and we actually learn the sounds that are attached to them. We mirror what we hear to create connections with the people closest to us. So... You grow up with a soft voice or a nasal voice or a rough voice, and you think that you're somehow stuck with that, but you're not. In the time that we have today, I'd like to help you figure out what sounds could be working for or against you so that you can create a voice that works for your life, 
for for your personality, for your goals, and and, and illuminates your courage and your passions. I want to tune your vocal instrument a bit. That's that's what I'm interested in doing today. I, I'm totally confident, and and Cindy has made it perfectly clear to me that the people in this room, of course, have giant business goals and successes. So let's talk for a second about how important is voice to business? Well, Inc. Magazine published an article saying that the cost of poor communications in the U.S., and in the UK alone is about $37 billion a year. Poor communication costs the average company with a thousand employees over $60 million a year in lost productivity. But the same report said that when a company has at least one, just one leader who is a great communicator, they produce a 47 percent higher return to shareholders after five years. That's why I say we need a new business communication model. I believe that your success and that of your company is literally resting on the tip of your tongue. The problem is for decades, public speaking courses have been missing the mark. They've been primarily focusing on the words instead of the sounds. Let me explain. I say we live in a world where people speak from word to word, thinking that if they had the right words to say, they could close the deal, get the funding, make things happen. But here's what science tells us. The brain processes spoken communication first for emotion and then for logic. When you speak, your sounds go into the ears of your listener. And the first part of the brain that deals with that sound is called the amygdala. The language of the amygdala is emotion, not logic. Words by themselves don't have any inherent emotion. I love my wife. I hate my wife. I love golf. I hate golf. I'm excited. I'm bleeding out. The words by themselves don't have any emotion. When you attach sounds to them, they become emotional. I love my wife. I hate golf. Now, you know how I feel about my wife, and you have a pretty good indication that I'm not crazy about golf. The language of the amygdala, as I mentioned, is emotion. So when the sound goes to that first part of the brain, the amygdala decides, is it emotional? And if it is, it passes it on to the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that processes it, takes action upon it, stores it into memory. If it doesn't think that the information is emotional, it stops it right at the amygdala and doesn't even bother to pass it on to the brain. You've heard that expression, people don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. This is the scientific understanding of it. Most people are speaking in a way that I say is called shallow communication. They're saying words, but it isn't getting past the amygdala because it doesn't sound emotional enough. That's shallow communication. I'm teaching a system called deep communication, which gets right past the amygdala as fast as possible, goes into the prefrontal cortex where you want your communication to be so that people can feel things, so that they can remember things. That's the difference between shallow communication and deep communication. Words, of course, matter. But what I'm saying is we need to focus on the sounds that are attached to those words. To, to move our communication model away from just word to word and make it emotion to emotion. There was a study done within the last couple of years and they tried to identify how many emotions could, could people actually uh, separate. And for years, they, could on, they only thought there was four main emotions and then it, they sort of stretched to 12. And, but 12 was the limit of, of emotions they could get 
the uh, the people in the studies to agree on. That sounds like this emotion. That sounds like this emotion. Every single one of those studies presented audio files to people that were words and sounds, of course, words and sounds. So this one study decided we'll do something a little bit different. We'll take the words out and we'll just present sounds to people. Ah, ah. We'll just show them sounds. It turns out that when they took the words out, people could clearly identify 24 emotions, 24 emotions. I remember um, my student, John Gray, who wrote the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And when I first started teaching him, he used to, he used, I said to him, what do women want to hear? What does my wife want to hear when I come home? And he said to me, your wife wants to hear this. Hmm. Ah. Mm. She didn't want the words from you. She just wanted sounds to come out of your mouth that said you were listening to her. Nobody cares what I what what happened to me at work. I'm I came home. I wanted to listen to her. He says that's what she wants. So very interesting. There's lots of emotions, and the way to access those emotions and have communications from emotion to emotion is to focus on the sounds. The number one fear in America is public speaking. Canada's maybe a little smarter, by the way. It has it as number two. Number one fear in Canada, heights. There you go, right? But the rest of the world, one or two, fear of public speaking. So what are people so afraid of? Well, they're afraid of being judged harshly. It's, it's not comforting or, or self-confidence building to open up your mouth and speak at a meeting, at a social thing, wherever you're whoever you're speaking to, it doesn't feel good to open up your mouth and speak and be judged harshly. But yet that's what we do. When we speak to someone, they make value judgments about us because they don't know us. They're just trying to fill in the story. When you hear me talk, your brain says, oh, I wonder how old he is. How long has he been married? Does he have any kids? What school did he go to? Has he ever lived in Canada? Does he have any money in a Canadian bank account? You start asking yourselves all kinds of questions. And worse than the questions, you start answering what you think should be the answers. And you're all of a sudden creating a relationship with me in your mind. Why is he wearing blue? How come he's wearing a sport coat? Didn't he just say it was hundred degrees in California? So these conversations that you're having with yourself, you think you're getting to know me, but you're not getting to know me. You're only making your own story. So people are afraid of being judged harshly, of other people listening to them and creating the wrong story. Uh, that's another huge reason why when you learn how to use your voice to control the sounds that come out, that controls the perceptions of other people. You present the parts of you that you want people to know. You present the, the caring parts of you, the empathetic parts of you, the intelligent parts of you, the personality-driven parts of you, your passions. And they don't judge you harshly because you're, you found a way of presenting the best of you. They hear and feel the best of you. So then it eliminates a lot of fear. I'm never worried that people are going to judge me harshly when I talk about about voice. Voice is my passion. Voice, I've spent my life learning about voice and teaching voice. I consider myself to be the gift when I talk to people about voices. I'm not worried about how people perceive me. I'm, I've focused on giving myself and my knowledge and my passion away. And when you do that, you're received in the same vein. You're received with kindness and love and empathy and caring and attention. That's how it works. So let me give you a couple of, of really simple things I want you to think about and listen for the rest of the day and tonight and for the rest of your lives to be thinking about your voice. First, to have a great voice, you have to have great breathing because actually air is the delivery vehicle for the way that the sound comes out of your body and then is supposed to vibrate the bodies of other people. Those of you that didn't know, and we're thinking that sound is an audio thing. Sound is a physical thing. My job is to physically connect with people, to vibrate the bodies of the people. Haven't you ever been at a rock concert or any kind of a concert where there's giant speakers in the front of the stage and you walk by the front of the stage and the, the, the air coming out of those speakers could practically blow you over. It's happened to me on stage with rock bands that I used to teach in the 90s. And you walk by one of the speakers, I could fall over. Anyways, 
Breathing is really, really important. Most people don't breathe in a way that helps their speaking voice. Here's a, a quick lesson in breathing. You've all heard diaphragmatic breathing, so I'm not gonna bore you with that. In through your nose, because there are filters in the nose called turbinates, and when you breathe in through your nose, it becomes moist air. When you breathe in through your mouth, it feels super dry and it dries out your throat, dries out your vocal cords and stops you from talking and doing great business and communications all day. So breathe in through your nose, pretend you have a balloon in your stomach that comes forward. You won't look fat. You'll just have more air in your lungs. And here's the secret. Breathe in through your nose, fill up your tummy with air as if you had a balloon. Here's the secret. Roger only wants me to speak while my stomach is coming in. Think of yourself as if you'd swallowed an accordion. An accordion goes out, an accordion comes back in, and then you play it and sound comes out. That's how breathing works. Most of you are holding your breath the whole time you're speaking. Your stomach is tight and you sound like this. There's not enough air coming out. Now watch, this is me holding my breath, stomach not moving. Now I let my stomach yeah. come in, and what do you hear? Mm -hmm. You hear more air in the sound. I want you to practice only speaking while your stomach is coming in. That'll give you more resonance. That'll give you more volume. That'll give you more control over your voice. It'll sound more beautiful, more influential, more, more powerful, and, and, and it won't sound nasal and tinny and, and like you're holding your breath. That's the first tip. Second tip I have for you today is about melody. Most people, when they record themselves or hear themselves played back, they listen to their voice and they think, oh, their voice is so boring and it's so monotone. And what's the problem with this? It's because they don't understand what musicians know about melody. That the melodies in built into songs when the notes go up and when they go down and when they stay the same, that those melodies, the melodies of the songs are a gigantic part of what makes those songs hit songs, what makes people get up and dance or cry or feel major emotions, that the melody of a song is, is a vital part. But we've forgotten that when we speak. We just think that we don't really need any melody. We're not, we're not thinking we're composers or singers. So what happens is, is we end up speaking like this, not using a lot of different notes, which is called monotone. I want you to understand that there are three things you should know about melody. One is monotone. If you're just using the same note over and over, then it sounds like this. And what happens is if people hear the same note over and over as if you're just one, a broken down piano that has one note, if they keep hearing the same note over and over, then they think they know what you're going to sound like next. When they think they know what you're going to sound like next, they think they know what you're going to say next. Please mute yourself if you're not, if you're not the speaker right now. When they think they hear what you're going to sound like next, they think they know what you're going to say next. When you think, when they think they know what you're going to say next, you've lost them. They think they're more intelligent than you. They think that their brain works faster than you. They're bored. The average attention span of, of humans these days is eight seconds long. Microsoft did a study, eight seconds long. You start using the same note and eight seconds from there, they can't wait to leave you because they are bored to tears. You're making them sad and you sound depressed. It's my birthday. I'm just bored. So that's one type of melody. You should use that very sparingly, monotone. What you should understand is that there's two other types of melody. One's called descending scales, where you go from high down to low. Now I'm speaking and I'm going lower. When I get to a comma, I go down. You didn't bring me any presents. My name is Roger Love. Now I'm going from high notes to low notes. And you're like, Roger, I don't do that. I don't sound like Eeyore. I'm not going down. I'm not using descending scales because yeah, it sounds really depressing and it sounds really sad when I do that. And you're wrong. You're all using descending scales. You were unfortunately taught that in school. When you get to a comma, you go down. When you get to a period, you go down, down to a lower note, down to a lower volume. That was bad melody advice that you didn't even know you were getting from your elementary school teachers all over the world. When you go down, 
at the end. That's why you're getting interrupted. People think you're done. When you go down at the end using descending scales, you sound depressed, you sound bored. Why would you want to sound depressed when you're talking to anyone? We need to use more ascending scales, going from low notes to high notes. It's my birthday. My name is Roger Love. I'm so happy to know Cindy. I think she's amazing. We need more ascending scales when you have ascending scales. It's not that it sounds like a question. It sounds happy. I really love chocolate or I really love chocolate. It's my birthday, not a question, a statement. It's my birthday. I love chocolate. You need more ascending scales and you're not necessarily using enough because you read some silly articles about up talk and they told you you can't go up. You'll sound like a question. You'll sound like you're questioning everything and you, you won't sound sincere. Those weren't written by musicians or composers. Those were written by people that didn't understand melody at all. They weren't talking bad about going up in melody. Can you imagine if I told Mozart he couldn't go up when he felt like the note should go up, that all songs should be written like this? The hills are alive with the sound of music. Then the composers would say, get out of the room. That's ridiculous. I'll go up and down based on emotions. So melody, record yourselves later tonight. Listen back. Are you using descending scales going down at commas and periods? Stop it. At least stay on the same note when you get to a comma or ascending scale. Are you using descending scales? Are you doing monotone? Have you listened to you talk, yourself talk for two sentences in a row and all of it was just pretty much the same note? Stop doing that. You need more melody, especially ascending. You need less monotone. It's your, you're in control. You're the composer. I spend, I actually spent a big chunk of my teaching life putting the music back into people's speaking voices. So breathing, only speak while your stomach is coming back in. Melody. Pay attention to whether you're using descending scales, making yourself sound sad, depressing everyone else, monotone, making yourself sound boring, boring everyone else, or ascending scales, which keeps the attention span up, which makes them look forward to what you're going to say after a comma because you've led them to a surprise place where they know you're not done and you don't get interrupted anymore. More melody, better breathing. Those are my two tips for today. And, and before we go to Q&A, because I'd really, I'd love to do Q&A, let, let me just say that, that, again, you are not the voices that you were born with. The second you, you record yourself or you meet somebody like me, you can create voices that lead companies, influence communities and countries and change the way that the world communicates. That's what I'm trying to do. You can have a voice that, that showcases equal amounts of, of knowledge, of authenticity, of compassion and, and courage or anything else you want people to feel about you. You're in control over other people's perceptions of you once you learn what sounds you should be making and what sounds are stopping people from really being moved every single time you open up your mouth. So thank you for, for listening to me uh, for the last 20 minutes. Oh, thanks, Roger. And I'm going to work on my ascending order. Uh, we love you, Roger. 